Okay, so I want to do, well, I won't say a quick video. This one's going to be a good bit more involved than my previous video. This is going to go over actual set logic. It's going to go over set operations, tying it back to propositional logic, and going over several more things that we can do with sets. So this one's going to be a bit more involved, but anyway, let's just go ahead and hop in. Now, basic set logic, we are going to start with set operations. It's going to be very, very similar to what we did in propositional logic, and to the point that some of them are based on the exact same principles. But I digress. Here, we're going to start with basic intersections. So, the intersection of A and B, denoted as such, is read as A intersects B. Is a set of all elements that are elements of both A and B. So, particularly we have set A is A, B, C, E, F, but B is D, E, F, G. So we want to look at the ones that they share in common. So we can see that's E and F here. If we get the Venn diagram, it's just the section here where they overlap. So that means that A intersect B is just a representation of E and F. Nothing too bad here. Moving on, we have unions. So, union of A and B, denoted as such, is read as A, a union B, is a set of all elements that are elements of A or B. We have A, B, C, E, F for set A, D, E, F, G for set B. So, just combine all of them, remove any duplicates. So, you can see we have uh, E and F show up in both. Just kind of remove that, and then have A, B, C, D, E, F, G as such for the union. And then diagram wise, it's just fill in both sets and you're good to go. Moving on, we have differences and this one is going to be a little bit interesting as in it's not as straightforward as the previous one. So difference of A and B, noted as A minus B, is a set of elements that are in set A but not in set B. So we have actual set wise for Ross notation, we have A, B, C, E, F. B is D, E, F, G. We want to specifically take a look at the ones they share in common and remove those from the leftmost set. So A minus B gives us A, B, C, like so. Now, when it comes to the Venn diagram, just take the set A and remove the intersection, and you're good. So we did B minus A, then we would end up removing these from B we end up with D, G, very similar if we just kind of filled in this part of the Venn diagram. Now, that basically means that A minus B and B minus A are going to be dissimilar to each other as opposed to our previous ones where the order didn't really matter. Another one where the order doesn't really matter too much is going to be the symmetric difference. So the symmetric difference, A and B, denoted as A exclusive or B, is a set of elements that are a member of exactly one of A and B, but not both. So, this is going to be the union of A minus B and B minus A. So, the differences of both, and then just union them together. Essentially, what we're doing is excluding the intersection. So, take the ones where they share in common, and then union the rest. We have A, B, C. DG, exactly what we have. And it is denoted as exclusive OR because this is pretty much an exclusive OR. It is just the parts that they have that are unique to each other, but there is no inner over or overlap between. Now, moving on, we have complement. This one's very similar to say negation and the fact that it's noted in the same way, just a bar over the top. Set of all elements in a universal set that are not elements of A, or what we have here. You can view the rectangle as a universal, the A here. So our universal set is 1 through 10. Our set A is 4, 5, 6, 7. So pretty much what we do is look at the universal set and remove the elements from set A. So we end up with 1, 2, 3, 8, 9, 10. Just like that Venn diagram shows everything in the universal set that's not in set A. So our set of operations here is going to be intersection, union, difference, symmetric difference, and complement, just like we went over. It has some descriptions of all of these, but if you take a look, you can see the intersection has and, 
Union has four. And, and I know the difference is that or I want to point out the top two here and then complement as well. So the and here for intersection is the same thing as a conjunction, whereas union is the same thing as disjunction. They are pretty much the same operation, just one is happening in set logic, whereas the other one's happening in propositional logic. Complement is basically the same thing. Negation. And then I, I did say that symmetric difference is basically the same thing as exclusive or. So all of these four have a one-to-one -one correspondence with propositional logic operations as well. Now, just like propositional logic, we can string a bunch of these together. So take a look at this. We have three sets, A, B, and C. A is 1, 2, 3, 4. B is 3, 4, 5, 6. C is 2, 3, 5, 7. And we have Venn diagrams of all of it. And then we have some order of operations, which would be pretty similar to what we did in propositional logic. But let's take a look. So we have A, union, parentheses, B, intersected, C. So first, we want to take a look at the parentheses and see that we want the intersection of B right here and C. We got three and five. Yep, so three and five, that's what we end up with. And then we want to simply union a, which means that we are going to add this part to it, like so. And that is the overall set. So we should end up with one, two, three, four, five, just like this. So this will be our final set for this order of operations and set operations. Yeah. Moving on, we are going to look at set identities. And mostly this is the part where we look at the parts of set logic that overlap with propositional logic. Now, set operations, intersection, uh, one sec, intersection, union, and complement can be defined by logical operations. So, it is essentially elements that are in the set of A intersect B, all the same as elements of set A, join with elements of set B and then union would be the same thing as disjunction whereas oh, this is what I have a bar on the top negation or complement is the same thing as negation now the sets universal which are you and the empty set correspond to the constants of true and false so if we take a look at it we have you same as true and set as well false now Using these, it's very easy to see how these correspond to props of the logic. So real quick, let's take a look at a set A equals one, three, six. And then, and just this, just, let's just do this. So A union, well, intersect the empty set so we want to see where one three and six overlap with well nothing and if we translate this to propositional logic we'd have a conjoined with false which we know is going to be false so a intersect empty set is the same that's just the empty set because there is no intersect. And if we did say A intersect the universal set, well, that would just be everything in the universal set. And if we basically intersect those together, then it is going to be the same thing as doing A joined true which is basically the same thing as like a times one, we know that that is going to be just a. So a intersect union, or not a intersect union, a intersect the universal set, I'm so sorry, is going to be a. Overall, that shouldn't be too bad. You can see the same thing with union, or if you have a set a uh, unioned with the empty set, you're not adding anything to it. 
So it's still set A. And if you do A union the universal set, you're adding set A to the universal set, which is still just going to be the overall universal set. So not, not too big of a deal there. But this is the easiest way to show how these operations correspond with each other by using constants of the universal set and empty set overlap. Set identity is an equation involving sets that is true regardless of the contents of sets and expression. The concept is very similar to logical equivalency to the degree that set identities even follow a very similar setup regarding the laws of propositional logic, which is something we went over back in chapter one. So, since we know that we have intersect, union, and complement, along with universal set and the empty set well these correspond to conjunction disjunction negation true and false and if we have all of this represented in set logic well we can just take the existing laws of propositional logic that we already had and convert them over to set logic and they'll work the exact same way now we don't have conditional statements here and some of those laws but the ones that just used intersection oh no I'm sorry the ones that used conjunction disjunction negation trues and falses can be directly translated over to set logic by using unions intersections uh complements and the universal and empty set so one to one correspondence here very very nice Moving on, we are going to take a look at type of sets outside of roster notation. In this case, we have ordered pairs. So some that most people have seen in some format in the past. So ordered pair of items is written as parentheses X, Y. The use of parentheses goes to curly braces indicates that the order of the elements is important as we are no longer using Rosh notation. So what that means is that x, y is not equal to y, x unless x equals y. And basically what this x equals y is like if you have 5, 5. Well, if you swap the order, it's still 5, 5. But I digress. A lot of people have seen ordered pairs in the form of Cartesian products. So basically if you had a coordinate plane and you had say x, y was 3, 5, you'd have to point at 3, 5. Groundbreaking, I know. But in Cartesian products, we can do the same thing with discrete math. For two sets A and B, the Cartesian product of A and B, denoted as A cross B, is a set of all ordered pairs in which the first entry is in A and the second entry is in B. So basically, it just follows the order of this cross product. So it is important to note that A cross B is not the same as b cross a as the order of values will be reversed what does that mean well, we have examples of set a goes one two b goes a b c and we end up with a cartesian product of one a one b one c two a two b and two c so the number comes first and then the letter because well a is one and two and then b is a b c now notice something, there are, we do cardinality of A cross B, we should get six, because each of these are individual sets inside of it. There are six sets inside of this. The order of these sets does not matter, as what this really is, is the roster notation of the ordered pairs generated from the cross product. So the order of the ordered pairs doesn't matter. The order of the elements inside the ordered pairs does matter. And that is because the reverse cross product, B cross A, now instead of having 1A, so on and so forth, we have A1, A2, B1, B2, C1, and C2. But the cardinality is still 6. So that's not going to change too much. The only thing that's going to change between a cross B, B cross A, is the order of the elements inside the ordered pairs. 
And then if you want to make a Cartesian product of infinite values, you can just use Z equals a set of all integers and then do Z cross Z. And you end up with this very expansive, well, universally expansive uh, cross product. But this is just kind of an example of saying how you can do something with an infinite set. Not super relevant right now. Now, we went over ordered pairs and that's because they're very, very common, but we also have the concept of ordered list, which is just going to be a triple. So order triple, and then ordered n tuples. The order triple is basically an x, y, z, and the only reason this has its own designation is because it 3D coordinate systems exist and they're very commonly seen. So that justifies having its own designation, but anything beyond that, it's kind of hard to keep track of. So we just call it n tuple. So this would be a four tuple, whereas this would be a five tuple. Now, these we can view very similar to arrays. They're more commonly used to seeing ordered lists and whatnot in programming because the concept of arrays and vectors and lists and whatnot, the index order wouldn't matter. So it'd be like 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, stuff like that. So these directly translate to arrays. So you should be familiar with the concept of how these work in general. Now, moving on, we have strings, and this is pretty much a direct continuation of ordered list to a point that program languages like C actually treat strings as just a character array. As previously mentioned, one of the common uses of ordered lists are arrays. So all you do is take the idea of those ordered lists use it as a sequence of characters and all of a sudden you have what is known as a string. Now the set of characters used in a set of strings is called the alphabet. So we have some set of characters that we have set aside and we can create any type of string using these characters. You see this pretty common and say the English alphabet. You have Ross notation A, B, C, ellipses y z and that is because we can take any of these characters or 26 and create words i mean like everything you see most of the stuff you see on this slide here are used via the english alphabet so a b c d f so this is just c a l l e d that's a string derived from our english alphabet which is a set of characters A through Z. That's about it. So then you see it being used there. And then the length of a string is just the number of characters in it. So it's basically the cardinality of that string. So here we have X, X, Y, X, Y, X. The length is six and the alphabet would just be X, Y. Nothing too fancy going on here. Now, here we have binary strings. And this is where things get a bit more interesting in regards to computer science and computer engineering. So binary string is a string whose alphabet is strictly just zero and one. A bit is a character in a binary string. A string of length n is also called an n-bit string. So this is where we came up with the idea of what gets passed to computers. So Let's say we had a four bit computer or something, we can pass in say one zero one zero. This would be some binary value. We have individual bits inside of it. This would be a four bit value. Four bits. And you have like 16 bit, 32 bit, up to our very common modern 64 bit values. So that's everything that we'd have inside of a modern computer. And then again, same thing, length is seven. So we have seven bit string for this example right here. Now, Beyond this, we have the concept of empty strings. A very unique string whose length is zero and is usually denoted by the symbol lambda. This is something that's commonly used to denote the end of a string, denote an empty state, and denote several other things that you'll see very commonly in say, finite automata, uh, Turing machines, stuff like that once you get to more formal languages and whatnot. 
but in terms of say strings moving back to how c treats everything as a character array it's basically a null term in a character array so if we had say this word ant a n d and you can treat it as either this or lambda however you want to view it basically it's some null terminated string and then also lambda gets used pretty frequently to dictate have an empty state so that this is a, a symbol you'll see pretty frequently and if you get into some of the more theoretical aspects of computer science so since 0 1 0 is a set of all binary strings of length 0 the only thing you can have is just lambda myself because that is an empty string and then we have the process of concatenation which is just appending a string or individual characters to the end of another string so in this we have string s which is 0 1 0 string t which is 1 1 and if we can concatenate this together of st we get 0 1 0 1 1 concatenating in string with the entry set results in the original string so x concatenated lambda is just going to be x not a big deal there set strings moving on we have the idea of sets being disjoint the two sets are said to be disjoint if their intersection is empty so if i were to take set a and set b a b i'm gonna just do one two three five six so this is not disjoint because there's something in the intersection however if i remove the intersection all of a sudden these two sets are now set to be disjoint a better way to view this would be to separate the actual venn diagrams and that makes it a little more apparent that these two are completely disjoint a sequence of sets is pairwise disjoint if every pair of distinct sets in the sequence is disjoint and that will come into play when we move to partitions so a partition of a non-empty set a is a collection of non-empty subsets of a that set each element of a is in exactly one of the subsets and this probably means absolutely nothing just reading that out but there's a few things you can use down here to make it make a bit more sense so first for all i that element well i guess this subset must be a subset of a now for all those they cannot be an empty set they must be something they must have elements inside of them and then for each one it would be a1 a2 a3 a4 and so on and so forth all of them must be pairwise disjoint they cannot have any overlap whatsoever and then if we union them all to together we should end up with the original set it'd be something like this when you had five six four two three I want to break it down to five, six, four, and two, three. There's no overlap. The three and two don't overlap with six and four or five. None of these sets actually overlap. Here, I'll just go a bit better. They're all pairwise disjoint. None of them are empty sets. All of them are subsets of A. And then if I union them all back together, I get two, three, four, five, six, which is exactly what I had to begin with. So that makes it a full-on partition. And then here is a bit of a better illustration of that. So we have set A of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And then I create partition, or not partition, but subset 1 of 1, 4, 5, 2 of 2, 3, 3 of just 6. Now, 1, 4, 5, it's not overlap with 2 or 3 or 6. So none of these overlap. They're all pairwise just 20. That's step 1. None of them are empty sets. That's step two. They are all subsets of A. Step three. And then finally, if I union them all back together, I end up with the original set of A. Therefore, A is now a partition of all of these smaller sets. This is an example of a finite partition. And they're actually very, very useful when you're starting to deal with like hard drives and data integrity of the file systems and whatnot, but maybe that for a different day. 
But what happens when we have infinite sets? Well, it gets really hard to analyze all the data in it. So maybe you just kind of create like a partition and you factor out a few smaller sets from it. You can analyze some data on that, put it back, and you end up with the original set still. So let's just think all integers. That's our overall infinite partition here. Well, we can treat B1 as all integers less than one, basically this section. B2, the actual one we want to analyze, of integers one that are less than or equal to x, which are less than or equal to three, so basically one through three inclusively. And then section three has all integers greater than three. Basically this. Well, I can take this part right here, do some analysis on it, and just simply put it back when I'm done. Because obviously I'm not going to do analysis on the entirety of the original set because it's infinite. But maybe I want to take a chunk of like maybe the first 200 elements out and do some data analysis on that and see if there's a part, a pattern or anything we can recognize. We can recognize it, put that back, maybe grab a different segment out and see if that pattern continues. Put it back and then maybe take out a larger overlapping section and see if that does still continue. So it's just ways to break down data. And then sets are just ways of grouping data. So that's pretty much it, all I've got for sets. There's a lot you can do. There is a lot of tie-on to how propositional logic works. So everything that we did in chapter one ties into chapter three, because without the basis of propositional logic, we can't have set logic doesn't exist and set logic is now used to develop strings binary strings and we'll be able to use those in the future to kind of build the foundation for how modern computers work so everything ties together and there is some general direction that we have going forward for computer science and computer engineering so there is a method to the madness i promise regardless hope you guys learned something i'll see you in the next video